It's a pleasure to be here, as I said when, uh, earlier this morning, and to see so many um, legal professional advocates, students in the audience. Uh, and we are looking forward to a robust discussion among our three um, expert panelists and a very strong question and answer period. Um, so I'll start just briefly with a few remarks. My name is Anna Gallagher. I am the executive director of the Catholic Legal Immigration Network. And we are an affiliate organization with over 370 members in 49 states across the United States. I always like to say we're sort of a sleeping giant or a quiet organization. Uh, folks might not know our name as quickly as they know the ACLU uh, or other organizations. However, we do a lot of the groundwork to support and represent low-income immigrants across the United States. Um, we do, we help build their programs, we train them, we do advocacy, we also have a religious immigration services division, which represents and helps bring uh, sisters, brothers, priests, clergy to work in immigrant communities in the United States. Um, and in the last year, we added our uh, litigation. We've uh, beefed up, increased our litigation quite a bit and have been involved as organizational plaintiff or have been directly litigating and suing the United States government for many of the policies that we'll discuss, we'll discuss today and especially on this panel. So we're very happy to be here. Um, one important thing I'd like to share with you is uh, our work at the border. We recently started what's called the Estamos Unidos Asylum Project uh, in August of this year. We generally do not do operations, folks. Clinic does all the building, supporting, accompanying, advocating. We don't do op operations. However, when there's a great need and we are asked to do so, we stepped in. So given the great need at the border, after seeing thousands of people stranded in Juarez without legal counsel, we decided to start and launch an asylum project. We're working closely in collaboration with HIAS, and you'll hear a little bit more about that from Sue. Um, and this project involves providing Know Your Rights rep uh, charlas, uh, talks to the thousands of immigrants, forced migrants in Juarez, consultations to identify potential options for relief and how we can represent them. Um, we also are doing representation. We're creating a pipeline from A to Z, teaching about rights, consultations, identifying attorneys in the United States to take these cases. So I would urge you to go to our website and look at that project and also volunteer. We are now starting to invite and have attorneys go down and work with my staff down there uh, with the forced migrants to, to, to help them with their cases. So please go to our website, sign up as a volunteer, support, share it with your other folks. Um, so that's the Estamos Unidas. Now, what we're going to do, to, just to move uh, forward now with the panel, is what we intend to do in this panel is to talk to you about um, sort of the origin of some of these policies. And we will talk about race issues uh, when talking about these origins. We're going to talk about nuts and bolts, what it looks like on the ground. And then um, we're going to talk about the human face of it. Well, while, while I was preparing for this panel, we had a call. Um, and I asked Joel Rose, uh, who is our reporter on the panel, uh, what struck him most when he started reporting on this issue. And he talked about the complexity. So I have to share with you, after 30 plus years doing this work, I wake up every day, there's new things happening, and there's plenty that I don't understand. So I think we're all in this together. Hopefully we can clarify some of these things for today. Um, and, and share our experiences with you. So just moving on to our panelists, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Dylan Corbett. He is the founding director of the Hope Border Institute, which is a research policy, work leadership and development and um, action organization unique to the United States and Mexico border region. Um, the project turned four in May of this year. 
Uh, Dylan brings a unique perspective to this panel in that he worked in Washington, D.C., and now he's on the border, so he sees it from both sides. Uh, and he will talk to you about why the Hope Border Institute was started and share his experiences along the border and talk about it in terms of uh, also the recent El Paso shootings. Uh, we also have Sue Kenny Fassler uh, uh, from oh. Hyas Falser. <laughs> I always mispronounce it, sorry, Sue. <laughs> okay. From Haya, she is the director of the Border and Asylum Network. She works, she has been working, she and her team have been working quite a bit this past year on developing processes along the border, uh, services for the forced migrants. Um, and she also, so they've put fellows in different places along the border to assist the migrants there. She's gonna share her role, what Hyas does, why they do the work, and she's gonna explain to us the nuts and bolts, what is happening on the border today the categories of people who are facing the migrant, uh, the, 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 these procedures, and what we can and are doing. Um, and finally, we have Joel Rose, our immigration reporter for NPR. Um, he puts a human face on these complex issues. He's relatively new to the immigration beat, and he's been quite busy. So I'm looking forward to hearing Joel's stories. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dylan to start our discussion. Uh, thanks, Anna. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor to be here. It's an honor to, to receive the invitation to be able to speak with you today. And I'm really honored to be among uh, friends and colleagues here on the panel. Uh, and with my friends in clinic, and and thank you for the work that you're doing at the border. It's really, um, it's been great to be able to collaborate with you on that, and it's so important, uh, the work that you all are doing, actually, both of you. I also understand that it's, um, uh, it's, 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 this is an exclusive club, not everybody who's invited to speak gets to speak at this conference, so I'm honored to be able to, to have something to say to y'all. <laughs> Um, I do want to uh, talk a little bit about, um, and I thought it might be appropriate to talk a little bit about the situation in El Paso. Uh, I come from the Hope Border Institute. We work in a binational way in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. Um, and so it's hard to talk about these immigration issues for us uh, without acknowledging what happened uh, back on August 3rd, just uh, two months now. So on August 3rd, as you know, um, there was someone who drew, drove 650 miles uh, from another part of Texas, a uh, faraway place, uh, to come to El Paso, Texas. Uh, and he took the lives of 22 Latinos. Um, and the wounds for us right now are still fresh, the physical wounds, uh, the psychological wounds, uh, the spiritual wounds. Um, and so we're still dealing with that. But, if anything uh, was made clear because of what happened on August, 20, on August, August 3rd um, with that matanza, and I use the word matanza on purpose because there are historical, uh, there are historical um, reverberations with what's gone on before uh, with, the, with the killing and the persecution and the torture and the lynching of Latinos on the border. This has been going on for some time. There's, a, there's historical precedents for this. If there's anything that, that that made clear on that day was that the same the same politics of exclusion, the same policies of xenophobia um, that are driving the policies that we're seeing on the border, in some way, directly or indirectly, we can have an argument about that. But the same that same spirit of xenophobia drove what happened on that day, and there are parallels uh, and there are resonances. Uh, between what happened and what we're seeing on the border. Sue's going to talk a little bit about the different policies uh, and the different changes, uh, the different things that we're seeing every day on the border. And it's true. We're dazed, just as we were on that day, day on August 3rd, we're dazed, we're confused, we're wounded uh, by all these changes that we're seeing in rapid succession on the border. It's like being at the end of a fire hose. Uh, but if there's one thing that, that, um, that, that, that I would say from our perspective on the border that you need to keep in mind, whether it's remain in Mexico, whether it's the sending people to third countries, uh, whether it's the deployment of the military, whether it's uh, policies to make people wait um, in Mexico because they're metered or being turned back on the bridge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, the only policy of the US government right now on the border with respect to migration is simply deterrence. And it's deterrence at all costs. And it's deterrence whether that is deadly or not. Uh, people are dying on the US-Mexico border. 
uh, people are dying in the custody of the U.S. Of the U.S. government uh, on the border. Um, and that deterrence has a couple faces. If it's deterrence, think of it as a coin. On the one side of the coin, it's criminalization. And we've seen this been going, we've seen this go on for, for some time now. Uh, but the U.S. government is simply criminalizing more and more people and convincing other Americans that we have to fear the people who are coming to the border to the point now where legal asylum seekers, asylum is effectively over at the border, asylum seekers are treated like criminals, whether they're detained or simply thrown back to a dangerous city like Ciudad Juarez. The pall of criminality has been cast over them. That's one side of the coin. And on the other side of the coin, you have what we see every day on the border, the militarization of the border the hardening of the border, more agents, more money, more resources, the militarization of our community with checkpoints and helicopters and walls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these things we effectively have now a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border, whether it's a wall of policies, a wall of hate, or an actual physical wall which is being built in our community. Um, those are the two sides of the, of the coin. And there are historical precedents for that too. The reality is that this has been going on for some time. And it's been enabled by both Congress and the administration, the White House. It's been enabled by both Democrats and Republicans. There is a categorical difference between what's going on then and now with the Trump administration. And it's this, it's simply the radicality with which these policies are implemented and embraced and the cruelty with which they're implemented. That's the difference. The toolbox is there, and it's been there for a long time, but it's the radicality and it's the cruelty, and that's why it's so deadly. Um, and again, none of this is responding to actual policy gaps at the border. There's no, simply no argument to be made that what we're doing, these policies of criminalization and these policies of militarization are effective, sensible, rational policy from any point of view. Technocratically, it, it, they just don't make any sense. And so because of that, it's impossible for us not to see, and again, this is what was clarified, if there was any doubt for us on the border on August 3rd, it's impossible for us not to see that these are driven by a politics of fear, by a politics of hate, and by a politics of xenophobia. And it has become deadly. And not just for migrants anymore, but for people in El Paso. And that has to stop. <laughs> um, thank, thank you, Dylan. And before we move on to Sue, I wanted to, we, we spoke a little bit when we started about why the Hope Border Institute was created. Um, I'd like you to share a little bit about what we talked about with the audience. Sure. Uh, the Hope Border Institute, as Anna said, we turned four uh, over the summer. And uh, we were really driven by um, what happened in 2014. Again, in 2014, you saw the rise of arrivals uh, to the U.S.-Mexico border. And so um, the desire for the community was, there was a lot of things that happened at that time, humanitarian response, just like you're seeing now to the, to the influx of folks who are coming to the U.S.-Mexico border. Lots of humanitarian assistance, lots of humanitarian aid, lots of outpouring of volunteers, and so forth. But we also realized that what we needed to do as a community was to be, to be able to work in a binational way across borders to make sure that our aspirations, our hope, our imagination, our vision for the border was implemented in places here like Washington, D.C. Because these policies which are, which are affecting the U.S.-Mexico border, and again, this has gone on for a long time, whether it's Austin, Texas, or Chihuahua, or Me Mexico City, or New York City, Wall Street, or, or Washington, D.C., the policies that come out of those places affects our community. And often, we don't have a voice. We have no, we have no way to have a, a role. We, we're not at the decision-making table. And so we do education, we do advocacy, and we do policy work because we believe that solutions to these problems ought to come from the border. And if our border is going to be affected by these policies coming from far off places like Washington, D.C., then we deserve a place at the table. And so that's why we're here. Thank you, Dylan. Um, now we'll move on to Sue, who's going to talk to us, share um, her work with HIAS, um, what they're doing, and, uh, uh, and the details of the work and what's going on on the ground. Sue. Thanks, Anna. So, um, Hias, uh, you may be wondering, I didn't know they were at the border. That's, that seems strange. Well, Hias has been around a long time, since 1881, and we've always done asylum. 
Um, but in the last year, we've decided to expand our asylum work and really focus on the border. And that was really made um, possible by a strong commitment by the American Jewish community. They really stepped up and funded this work. And all of our work has been, uh, so far on the US side of the border, funded entirely by uh, Jewish community foundations, Jewish donors. Um, so I manage all of Hyas's programs on both sides of the border currently as the Director of Border and Asylum Network. On the US side of the border, we, have, we started with a program called the Highest Border Fellows, whereby we fund um, full-time uh, attorneys to, be, to work with organizations on the ground at the border to serve more asylum seekers. One of our border fellows is actually here with us today, Nico Palazzo, right there. He's our, he's our border, border fellow with um, Las Americas Immigrant, Immigrant Advocacy Center in El Paso. We have another uh, fellow in El Paso and another in San Diego. We're gonna be expanding and adding more fellows as well. Um, part of the Border Fellows Project is also to support pro bono delegations of attorneys from all around the country to travel to our partner organizations, to spend a week with them, to add more capacity and serve more asylum seekers. You can find out about um, volunteer opportunities on highest.org. Um, most exciting recently has been in June, we op uh, I'm sorry, in, in August, we opened an office in Juarez, um, the, the ha first highest Mexico office. Um, we have, uh, it's, we're funded by UNHCR Mexico, and it's currently a legal office only with uh, two Mexican attorneys and two paralegals, and we work very closely with the clinic staff on the ground there in El Paso to do the Know Your Rights presentations, one-on-one -on -one screenings, and refer clients to people like Nico, our border fellows on the other side of the border, to try to get someone out of MPP, for example, to try to, or to uh, represent them in their full asylum case. Um, we are expanding that work. Uh, UNHCR Mexico has asked us to submit a proposal to now work in also Tijuana, Mexicali, and Monterrey. So by next month, we hope to be operational in those locations as well. And we're also expanding beyond legal um, services to include services for mental health and psychosocial support and services for survivors of gender-based violence in all four of those locations. Um, so I've been to the border a lot in the last year. I think I counted six, six times. And um, I'm not the one doing the work, but I'm the one working with our partners, working with the, the lawyers and implementing the programs, designing the programs. And I also communicate on a regular basis with the lawyers that are down there doing the work. And there's a Facebook group called uh, Migrant Persecution Protocols, uh, which is what the MPP should be called instead of Migrant Protection Protocols. And I asked them yesterday on Facebook, uh, what, what's the number one thing they would like this audience to know? And the responses were, the situation is worse than you think. It's inhumane. Um, people's human rights are just completely disregarded. Just how dangerous it is. Um, people are kidnapped virtually every day from right outside the immigration office where they're dropped off. Um, even for lawyers, uh, one lawyer mentioned that she's looking into kidnapping insurance now because it's so dangerous, it's particularly in Tamaulipas, um, the, the, the area of the border across from uh, Brownsville and uh, McAllen. Um, it's, it's so dangerous uh, for all involved. Um, as someone on the first panel mentioned, Human Rights First uh, recently reported that there's been 340 public accounts of rape, kidnapping, and violent assaults, but that's vastly underreported. It's probably double that. Um, there's people sleeping in the streets in tents, no access to clean water. And even when they can get in the sh to, the, to a shelter, the shelter quality varies greatly. So it's, it's very dire. It's more dire than you think it is, is what they wanted me to, to let you know. Um, and also, in terms of the lawyers in the room, it's, there's a complete assault on due process. Um, there's no access to counsel, which is the most obvious one. Um, on the NTAs, the notice to appear, the addresses that are put for the migrants are fake addresses. Usually it's for a, a shelter that they've never even been to. And some NTAs lately are saying Facebook as the address for the migrant. Um, there are no longer going to be interpreters provided. They're going to be shown a video um, explaining their rights, but no actual interpreters do it during the hearings. Um, and then there's the tent courts um, that are happening in, in, in Brownsville um, and the judges that are only appearing via TV screen. And so they don't have the opportunity to really judge the body language 
of, of, the, of the migrant and, and really be able to assess their, their credibility. So it's, the order of the day is chaos and confusion, and it's designed to be that way. It's designed to be cruel. Um, and there's no normal. Sometimes people ask, like, well, tell me a normal day. Well, there, there is no normal. And it's, again, it's designed to be that way because everything's unpredictable. But I'm going to do my best to walk you through some of the process. Some of you, this may be elementary, but I, I figure there's a lot of people here that don't know the nuts and bolts of, of how things work. But starting with metering. So metering is the process by which you, instead of being able to present yourself at the, at the border and say, I have a fear of persecution in my home country, uh, you are then put, you're, you're instead put on a list called a metering list where you have to wait your turn to do that. And that started in April 2018. And everyone has to go on the metering list, including Mexicans, okay? So they're, they're trying to flee the country in which they're being persecuted and they're being told, no, get on this list, you have to wait along with everybody else. And every port of entry is different. Every port of entry handles their list in a different way. It's a different entity managing it. It's a different way that it's run. Um, in Tijuana, the wait uh, from the metering list is about six months right now. And that's, so that's just to present yourself, right? In, in Juarez, it's about two to three months. Um, some statistics I found said there's approximately 26,000 people on the metering list right now um, in the various ports. I've, I've been hearing from my staff in Juarez that often um, they go through 50 names in a day, even though only like maybe 10 are being let in because so many people are not there. They're, they get on the list and then they either cross um, irregularly, as you would say, and are without inspection, um, or they travel to other parts of Mexico. Um, currently, you may have heard about a situation in, in Juarez with Mexican asylum seekers being camped out around the two bridges. Um, there's about 1,700, the numbers, or the, num the numbers being reported sort of, sort of vary, but they are Mexican asylum seekers, and the reason they're camped out at the bridge is because, again, this unpredictability. Um, one, one day, CBP came out and said, okay, we can take 50 Mexicans, and then all, 50 Mexicans got to go in, and then no one from the regular meeting, metering list got to go in that day. Um, this is reported by my, my, my managing attorney in Juarez, and and so the so word gets around, and everyone's like, "Well, I'm not going to leave. I want, what if they do that again? I'm going to camp myself right here." And so they won't go to the shelter because of this unpredictability. And of course, it's a very uh, dangerous situation because all the criminals know exactly where people are. Um, so once you do get your number called after this several month wait, if you express a fear or persecution in your home country, you are either allowed in and you're detained or you're put into MPP. So it's uh, the Mex Mexicans and not people from non-Spanish speaking countries are generally put into expedited removal and then they go through the credible fear or reasonable fear process um, in detention and then perhaps can become paroled or, or, or bonded out. But um, everyone from Spanish speaking countries other than Mexico are subject to MPP. So MPP, I keep saying, that's the migrant protection protocols, that's the remain in Mexico policy in operation. So, but again, more confusion, because not everyone who's subject to MPP actually gets put in MPP. It's very random. Sometimes people that would be subject to MPP are allowed in and they're put in detention. Um, often, this is where family separation is coming back again. Family separation 2.0 is what I hear it called often, where a family unit, say a, a, a mother, father, and two kids present, and perhaps the father is allowed in and he's detained and the mother and the children have to wait in Mexico, or vice versa. That happens literally every day. Um, there's other ways that family separation is happening as well. Um, Nico was uh, telling me about a client that he helped from uh, a dad from Guatemala whose two-year-old son was taken away from him because he had a wet diaper, and CBP alleged that he was a neglectful father. So then the, the child was then considered an unaccompanied minor because of this so-called neglect. So when you hear that family separation is no longer happening, don't take that at face value. So then when you're, what does it mean to be put in MPP? So you're in CBP detention and you're given an NTA, a notice to appear with a court date on it that's usually several months away and you're escorted by CBP to the bridge, and then Mexican uh, migration takes over, takes you back, drops you on the street, 
basically, <laughs> in, um, in, on the Mexico side. And you are there and have to wait until your court hearing of whatever's on your NTA. Um, there's supposed to be some exceptions to that in terms of vulnerable populations that are not supposed to be put in MPP, unaccompanied children, and people with severe health risks. Um, in, in reality, people are put into MPP that fall into those exceptions every day. Um, there's also an option to ask for a non-refoulement interview. And that means uh, you are afraid to return to Mexico to wait until your court hearing. Um, but you have to ask for it. You are never asked affirmatively, are you afraid to go back to Mexico? So either you have to wait till your hearing, which is, again, three or four months out, and affirmatively say it to the judge at the point when the judge says, do you have any questions? Because again, they don't ever ask affirmatively. Or you have to find an attorney, such as our border fellows, um, helped by our staff in Juarez, to accompany you to the bridge and say this person has a fear of return for X reason. You have to prepare a packet. It has to be, there has to be evidence. Um, and then perhaps you can get a non-refoulement interview. But the non-refoulement interview is shrouded in secrecy. No attorneys are allowed to participate. Um, they used to let us just listen in. No more. It, the, the, they're conducted by phone by an asylum officer in Arlington currently. Um, but uh, it's very, very hard to win these interviews. Less than 1% of people um, that ask for a non refoulement interview actually are granted it and allowed to be taken off of MPP, which means if they're taken off of MPP, they're then detained and put into um, removal proceedings. The people who, who have tended to be successful in getting out of MPP in the past have been um, LGBT individuals and, and pregnant uh, women, particularly after the second trimester. But Nico was actually just telling me that even LGBT individuals, whereas before they used to let, uh, sort of let them in as a matter of course and take them off MPP because of the discrimination faced in Mexico, now they actually have to ha have been a victim of some sort of crime, some sort of violence before they'll even consider taking them off of MPP. So it's very, very hard to get out of MPP. Um, we now have this third country transit ban that we're dealing with, which says that anyone who entered after July 16th has to have sought asylum in a transit country and been denied before they can apply for asylum in the United States. And that applies to everyone along the southern border, except Mexicans. Um, and in terms of how that's playing out so far, there, were no, there was no guidance given to the judges, so it's been really hit or miss. Some judges are sort of tossing the football and saying, we'll deal with that at the individual hearing. Or, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, varying responses. I, I've heard of judges that uh, asked, <laughs> there was a, a friend of mine who's an attorney in El Paso that was, happened to be in San Antonio when there was a hearing in Brownsville via TV. And he asked her randomly, it was ta Taylor, hey, will you write a brief on, on this? Because I don't know what to do. <laughs> so, and then he ended up, um, applying the third country uh, transit ban to this person anyway. It's, it's a mess, okay? It's a mess. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the last thing I, I wanted to just touch on was this idea of uh, IOM, the International Organization for Migration, is being funded by the Department of State of the United States to provide assisted voluntary returns from these border cities. And there's been about 3,000 people so far um, from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador that have been provided with free trips, bus, or, air, or plane to go back to their home countries. And, and those of us who are advocates really question the voluntariness of this um, because after waiting for months and months and months, you know, to even present your claim, and then you're put in MPP, and then you have your first hearing three months out. Oh, and by the way, there's more than one hearing. There's at least three, usually four or more, before you actually have your individual hearing. Those are several months apart. So you're talking a very long time that people are waiting. They get tired, they're tired, they're desperate. Um, and so that's why we question is this, how voluntary is this really? And are people being returned to harm? And the answer is advocates feel that most certainly they are. Um, and this is being funded by the US government. Um, also, these people who return, if they're in MPP and they decide to take IOM up on their offer to go back to their home country, then when it does come time for their next hearing date, the judge will order um, them removed in absentia. So they'll get an in absentia removal order, which will then bar them from ever seeking asylum in the US again. And they're not being advised of this. 
They're not being told, hey, do you know this is going to happen if you leave without going to court and try to terminate your case? And don't even get me started on trying to terminate cases. That's a complete mess, too. No judges know quite how to do it. DHS always objects. Um, so it's, it's it, again, it's a mess. And then the last thing, and one thing that our Juarez office is doing and that our other offices in Mexico are going to do um, is sort of an alternative option is that people can apply for asylum or humanitarian visas in Mexico. Um, and so that's what our attorneys are helping them with as a potential option. It's not an option for everyone, but more increasingly more and more people are seeking that option and we're representing them. Um, uh, Mexico uses the Cartagena definition of refugee, so it's a little bit of an easier standard, and it's um, more likely th with some of the claims that we're seeing from Central America that they will receive asylum in Mexico, uh, whereas in the United States they would likely be denied. So I talked a long time, and I will stop with that. <laughs> you covered a lot of complicated yeah. stuff very eloquently, so thank you, Sue. Um, I still, on a daily basis, get confused about the categories and who's in the categories because it does change almost every day. Um, Joel, now we'd like to hear from you um, as you've been reporting on the front lines and you're talking to people and asking them about their experiences both at the border and I believe in Central America. So please share. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you very much to Clinic and, and MPI for having me. Um, as you said earlier, and I'm, I'm pretty new on this beat. Um, when I started three years ago, it would have been very difficult to picture me on this stage because I knew pretty much nothing about immigration or immigration law. A um, little bit about DACA, refugee resettlement that I'd covered as an NPR correspondent in New York, but um, essentially I did not know what I did not know. Um, however, I was at Donald Trump's campaign announcement in 2015 when he came down the golden escalator um, and you know, described Mexicans as rapists, as we heard on the first panel. Um, so I knew that his rhetoric on immigration was going to be different than previous presidents, um, and that he'd run on a platform of cracking down on illegal immigration. But I was still pretty surprised, um, you know, how quickly he started rolling out policies aimed not just at Ill illegal immigration, but at legal immigration too, and <coughs> asylum, as we've been hearing. Uh, and so basically, I had to learn on on the job a lot of things, and I tested the patience of my sources, some of whom are in this room. <laughs> and so thank you to them. Um, and I, so, okay, so this is basically a long way of saying I cannot give you the long view about what's happening, but I have been to the border this year. I've been to Arizona in the spring and, and El Paso more recently um, in the summer. And so I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about the migrants I've met during my reporting, mostly in Juarez, um, and whose stories have really stuck with me and um, what they're facing at the border right now. No, there is not a moat with snakes and alligators, but there is this series of overlapping legal barriers that Sue has described really well. Um, largely remain in Mexico or, or MPP, the Migrant Protection Protocols, and now also this other level of the, the third country asylum ban um, that are making it, making it very difficult and nearly impossible for most migrants to access asylum. Um, let me start with an example of how family separation is still happening. Sue mentioned that a little bit. Um, there is a great aunt that I met at, the, uh, at a shelter in Juarez who'd come from Guatemala with um, two teenagers that she'd been raising for more than a decade. Uh, she was trying to get them together with their mother who's in Los Angeles. Uh, the kids were allowed in at the border as unaccompanied minors, um, but the, their aunt, their great aunt was not allowed to accompany them because she's not, that's not considered part of a nuclear family by CBP. So um, the kids were eventually able to reconnect with their mother in LA, but the great aunt was returned to Juarez under MPP. Um, and it, it's unclear, maybe even unlikely, that she'll ever get to join them. Um, and she was sort of gradually coming to terms with that, where I met her in the shelter. And I think it's the same story for many other um, aunts and grandmothers and, and other caregivers who are real caregivers to the children, to the young, you know, the minors that they're bringing to the, with them to the border, but they don't have the official documentation from a judge that would allow them to be considered, you know, like a parent. Um, another example of how uh, I wanted to talk about how vulnerable populations are being returned. Sue mentioned that as well. Um, I met uh, an eight-year-old boy named Yonatan in Juarez, a sweet young guy who had lost his eye to a tumor as a toddler, had a little glass eye that he would gladly take out and show you. Um, <laughs> but it's difficult to care for. It requires a lot of medical attention. Um, and that's one reason that his family decided to leave Guatemala 
Also, their coffee farm had failed. There were extortion demands, you know, mix of factors. But um, anyway, the family waited in line at the port of entry in, in El Paso and explained the situation with the eye, with Yonatan's eye. Um, and according to CVP's own guidance, migrants with known mental or physical, excuse me, physical or mental health issues are not supposed to be in MPP. But they sent this family back to Juarez anyway, um, where I met them. They were staying in a church that was run by, uh, sorry, they were staying in a shelter that was run by a local church. And they were pretty much afraid to go out. Um, I think they were, not sure if they're still there or not. Maybe Dylan might know. But, um, and one more uh, migrant example that I want to talk about that shows a couple of different uh, issues that have come up here, family separation um, among them. Uh, just last week, we published my story about a migrant named Gabi and her daughter, Sophia. Um, Gabi is a young mom who fled Honduras, uh, arrived at the border with her husband and their two children. They were separated in detention, um, possibly because they do not have an official marriage license. They're sort of common law married. And, but it's not clear why they were separated. Anyway, the husband and the seven-year-old son were released into the U.S. And Gabi was sent back to Juarez with her five-year-old daughter, who, by the way, was also sick with uh, very serious stomach problems that she had developed, Gabi says, while they were in detention in, in El Paso. That was back in March, uh, early April. Um, they've had a rough time of it in Juarez ever since. There was an incident where they were kidnapped by a cab driver. Um, they have bounced from shelter to shelter. They, when I spoke to them, finally had found some stability and, and had found a lawyer, which is rare. Um, of the almost 50,000 people that we know have been Sent back to Mexico under MPP, I think only 2% have found lawyers, is um, the statistics from TRAC. But so Gabi's daughter, Sophia, was still sick. Um, she was losing weight. She had dropped from 40 pounds when they arrived in, at the border to just 26, five-year-old. Um, and the mother felt like she was in a really impossible position of having to pick between her two kids. Um, you know, whether she should be fighting to try to get into the U.S. to rejoin her seven-year-old, who was with the father in Connecticut, uh, or go back to Honduras, which is the place that she thought she could get, you know, the best chance of getting her daughter healthy again, even though they would have to be in hiding, um, essentially. But So after spending six months in Juarez, her final asylum hearing was supposed to be last week, um, but she did not go. She took the bus that Sue talked about. Um, Gabby and Sophia took the bus back to Honduras. Um, her lawyer told me that she was disappointed. She thought they had a decent shot at asylum or at least they would have if they had been in an asylum court other than El Paso. But um, Gabi decided to go back for her daughter's sake. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about just briefly besides the legal obstacles that I saw when I was reporting in Mexico was the soldiers, the Mexican mm. soldiers who are very visibly there to try to discourage migrants from crossing into the US. Um, in the summer, they were easy to spot at the border. I don't know if that's still the case, but uh, you know. I was with a photographer, and, and several times this happened. We would walk up to a group of soldiers, try to talk to them, ask if we could take their picture. And they would say, no, 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 no. And then they would walk away. And um, they, when they would come back with their helmets and, like, and their full big guns. And then they'd say, OK, take the picture now. <laughs> um, and then they would Love sometimes it. talk to us, too, a little bit. But um, you know, as long as you don't want to know their names, they were, they were sort of forthcoming. Um, we watched some troops. Uh, sort of detain a, a migrant family from El Salvador who were uh, trying to cross sort of west of El Paso, you know, where Mount Cristo Rey is. They were sort of trying to cross um, into New Mexico. Um, a mother and two kids who had gotten, you know, thousands of miles from El Salvador all the way to the border and could literally see New Mexico. But these Mexican soldiers were there sort of blocking their way. And um, they did not make it, at least not while I was watching, they didn't make it into the US to ask for asylum. So. Um, the conclusions that I was hoping to leave you with, um, I mean, I think the administration has pushed a lot of the responsibility for what's happening, both from an enforcement and a humanitarian perspective, to the other side of the border, um, to, to Mexican authorities, both the, you know, in terms of the enforcement with the soldiers and in terms of caring for these almost 50,000 migrants who are stuck in Mexico until their hearings. Uh, and I think from the administration's perspective, this is working. The head of um, CBP recently called the migrant protection protocols a game changer. Um, it seems to be essentially the linchpin of the administration's strategy for dealing with the asylum flow at the border. Um, when the administration has been asked about the safety of migrants under MPP, they have said a couple of different things. One, um, 
The head of CBP said last month that reports of kidnapping and robbery are uncorroborated and unconfirmed by Mexico. Uh, Secretary McAleenan, Acting Secretary McAleenan, was asked a few weeks ago at an event like this one uh, about the safety of migrants, and he said they are talking to Mexican officials about how to make the system work better with more access to shelters and lawyers. Um, so kind of acknowledging that problems exist, but um, doesn't, you know, not the level of worry that would stop them from, from actually sending people back. Um, and the other thing to grapple with is that the border flow numbers are down, you know, I, you know from a high of more than 140,000 in May to just over 64,000 in August in, in terms of the number of migrants taken into custody uh, at the border. So um, the administration would argue that, that these changes, especially MPP, are a big reason why we've seen the numbers go down. Um, also, they talk about cooperation with troops at the border, the southern border, and also the Guatemalan border. Um, with me between Mexico and Guatemala. So, and I think conditions on the ground are bad enough that as we see at least some uh, migrants are giving up on making asylum claims in the US and are going back, um, which suggests that they have lost the hope that they had of finding a better future for their family that was driving so many people to make this trip earlier in the year. I mean, it seems like some people, um, for some people that's no longer true. You know, and uh, some people are choosing to stay in Mexico and, and you know, I've, Heard that there may be growing numbers who are seeking asylum there, but um, many others are deciding to go back to the situations they left, even when those situations are are very bad. Um, so that's uh, I guess that's where I'm going to leave it. Anna, can I come on and comment on one thing? That sure, said? sure. In terms of the um, the kidnappings and rapes being uncorroborated, I mean that's just laughable because often it's the Mexican authorities who are committing these. Uh, these atrocities and and even if someone if, even if it was not a Mexican a authority who committed it um, the man our managing attorney in Juarez was just telling me yesterday via WhatsApp that uh, there's a four-hour wait to go to the um, the place where women have to report sexual assaults mm. so it, it's not surprising that they think it's uncorroborated because they put up every barrier to actually be able to report these crimes and, and of course people aren't gonna report on those who are committing the crimes. Um, and I just had a comment, Joel, um, when you were talking about IOM and Sue as well, International Organization Migration Organizing um, Returns to Home Countries. When I was at the border two weeks ago, um, I spoke to a group that was 15 minutes from getting on a bus to return, mixed group of Hondurans and Salvadorans, had a conversation with them for about 30 minutes. Um, and all of them reported that they do not feel safe returning home. However, they're so desperate in Juarez, especially with their children, that they feel like they have no choice. So I think it's important to, 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 to say that in, in terms of what's voluntary. Um, and then I had a question. I have several, oh, I have a que several questions for our panelists before we take ours. Um, in terms of resources in Juarez for shelters, and humanitarian aid, Dylan. I wonder if you have any information to share with us because when I was there um, uh, and, and visited some of the shelters, by the government shelter uh, officials' own admission, there are not enough shelter space to house the migrants right now. And the person was not sure if they were going to receive more resources. So I wonder if you have any. Any information to share? Yeah, sure. Um, so Juarez is, uh, Celia Juarez and El Paso is one slice of the pie along the border, but I think it's representative. Um, MPP or Remain in Mexico was rolled out first in Tijuana and then um, later on came to, to El Paso where it was really scaled up. So, it, you know, we saw the first, um, you know, it was, it was rolled out and implemented on a large scale in El Paso and we've seen the effects of that. This year, um, as a result of Remain in Mexico, um, about 15,000 people have been returned to Ciudad Juarez from El Paso. Um, and then um, Sue mentioned the metering list, so the folks who are being turned back. Um, there are currently about between 6,000 and 6,500 people on that metering list. Now the population is very fluid. Um, there are folks who, who go back. Um, there aren't enough buses actually by IOM. There, you know, IOM is not, IOM, there, there, there are folks who are finding other routes back to their home countries be, besides IOM. So there are a lot of people going back. 
Um, but even if you took those numbers, you know, 6,500 plus 15,000, you know, let's say half of them have gone to another part of the border or half of them have tried to cross again into the United States or went back to their home country, that's still about 10,000 people that you have right now um, conservative uh, in Ciudad Juarez. In terms of shelter space, um, the, there are 2,200 people in shelters. So there's by no means enough shelter um, for folks. And now what you're having is the beginning of a long-term population. So you have people that are there for one, two, three, four, five. There are people there now for a long time. Um, so these are folks, uh, most of the shelters are pop-up shelters. They're run by churches, Catholic, Evangelical, Protestant. Um, some community organizations, the Mexican army and government recently opened a shelter for folks as well. But most of the folks are in these small pop-up, scrappy type shelters, um, you know, that are, that are running on a shoestring. They are timing out of the Mexican health system. They're no longer able to access the public health system in Mexico. And there's a lot of discrimination there. So even if formally they can, they, in, in reality they're, they're not able to. Um, they're trying to find jobs in the informal economy, but that's very difficult. Um, so there are a lot of people who um, just kind of are falling through the cracks. Um, there are folks who are trying to find apartments, you know, crammed into small uh, rooms and apartments. There are folks who have been kidnapped. We have, we've rescued people literally being held by organized crime and got them across the border who were kidnapped. Uh, you know, despite what the government says, kidnappings do happen every single day. Um, before the U.S. government used to limit deportations through Ciudad Juarez. And there's a reason for that, because as you know, Ciudad Juarez is a very dangerous city. This year, there are more than, as of today, there are more than 1,100 murders that have taken place in Ciudad Juarez. Between four and five people are killed every day in Ciudad Juarez. So it's a very combustible ecosystem. When you add to that a population of más o menos 10,000 migrants, you're creating a vulnerable population and you're creating the conditions for combustion where organized crime can flourish and we're seeing that all the time. Uh, we're in the courts documenting the violations of human rights that are taking place with folks who are in the Remain in Mexico program and there was literally a woman who got up in front of a judge one day and said, I am afraid to go back to, to, to Ciudad Juarez. Uh, I don't remember if she was given a non refoulement interview or not but the day that she was returned she was kidnapped by the police who turned her over to organized crime who raped her. Um, so those are the conditions that this population is, is facing right now. Um, uh, and, and it's easy to forget about them because they're on the other side. And then now we have the Mexicans who've arrived and there's a tent city on the other side. And if there's any question that, that remain in Mexico is illegal, and it is illegal, and I believe it's illegal, and I believe that we'll prevail in the courts on that, because uh, if you're returning people to a situation of danger, that does violate the principles of non fearful mont. But in the case of Mexicans, that's even more clear because we're returning them to the country that they are fleeing from. Um, and so uh, th this is just, this is, this is what folks are facing. And in Tamaulipas, uh, it's even more dangerous than Juarez. It's the State, State Department has delineated, delineated it as a, I think it's a level four it's called. It's the same. <laughs> level of risk as going to Syria and Afghanistan and Yemen. <laughs> and that's where our government is sending people back to when they are coming to our borders to ask for asylum. And so just following up on the issue of how long people wait, um, can you share information on, for example, very concretely, somebody's placed an MPP, um, they return to Mexico, they go back with their master calendar hearing, how long between how long do they have to wait to receipt to report and attend that first hearing and then thereafter how how long for their final hearing so the first master calendar hearing it, and again it varies port to port um but typically it's three to four months out um and then that first is a just a master calendar so it's continued and then the next hearing again is another three to four months out and that happen they have to go back and and get they get continued at least uh usually two to three Three to four times, Nico. Mm. Three, four. Um, it depends on you know on their particular situation whether they filed their own asylum application, a 589, um, whether they asked for more time to find an attorney, you know, various things. But generally, 
their individual hearing where they're not, you know, where they're heard on the merits is generally not till the third or fourth time that they've gone back to court. And again, it's three to four months in between each of those. Okay. I, I was going to say that uh, Gabi, the woman I, I wrote about in, in Juarez, she got from her initial um, placement at MPP, like very early on when it had just expanded into Juarez, I guess so early April, late March. And um, she got all the way to a final hearing by September which yeah. I think was quick. Your mm -hmm. lawyer thought, felt that that had moved through about as fast as it could. Yeah, the early, the early people in the MPP program got, yeah. got through faster, but it's getting longer and longer as more and more people. Yeah, you're hearing about good. people getting like, notices to appear at, well, well out into 2020, right? Oh yeah, for sure, 2020. Yeah. Um, I think one of the latest one I heard recently was June 2020. Wow. Well. So I think it's important, folks, for us to understand that people may well have to wait up to a year to get their, their full hearing before an immigration court on their asylum application. And that clearly has a huge chilling effect, if not a freeze effect, on accessing the asylum system. Because as we've seen, many people give up. And as all of us have seen at the border, the conditions, and especially for families, and there are many families and many children, and mothers and fathers are having a hard time staying in Mexico and caring for their children. Um, so this is another way to essentially decimate the asylum system. Um, I'm curious, Sue, as to the role of UNHCR along the border, and I don't know, Joel, Sue, or Dylan, it's if you can t talk to us about that and share that. Well, I know, um, I think Kiara is on the next panel that she's with UNHCR Washington, mm -hmm. um, so perhaps she could speak more on that. I mean, just sort of off the record, what I've heard is it's just very tricky mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. is the number one funder for UNHCR. Mm -hmm. um, there are now some, uh, lia what are they being called? Uh, border liaisons or something or other mm -hmm. that are, uh, there's one in El Paso and one in San Diego, but they have to sort of keep a low profile. Um, and then it's UNHCR Mexico uh, that is funding our work um, on the Mexico side of the border, but it's like an emphasis on uh, Mexican asylum, accessing Mexican mm -hmm. asylum, and I mean, it's it it has we have to be tricky about it. Like mm -hmm. that, we still can pr we still provide information and referrals to on the U.S. asylum system, mm -hmm. but um, you know they can't come out and be as strong apparently about this issue. But I'll leave that to to our UNHCR colleagues to go into more depth Thank on. You. And <laughs> smart. So um, just one more question before we open it up to, to our audience. Um, I'm curious, Dylan, um, are you seeing any other cross-border initiatives similar to the HOPE Institute um, in other border points? And it's, it's my understanding as well that the HOPE Institute initiative is a faith-based uh, in, uh, initiative as well. So if you could share that information with us. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of work is going on. Um, and there's a lot of faith-based work that's going on. The, the, the network of migrant shelters throughout Mexico is largely um, a faith-based initiative. Um, and it's been going on for some time. Um, and they're bearing the burden of it. The transfer, we've transferred the burden of, of this problem. I think Joel um, stated it well. Uh, to see Juarez and, and, and folks in Mexico, and that work is largely being taken up by faith-based organizations. Um, but every the situation is so fluid, and even when you look at a program like Remain in Mexico, the way it's being rolled out in different parts of the border, it just looks very, very different depending on where you are. Um, so it's really hard to coordinate. Um, it's really hard to coordinate across different sectors of the border. Um, and throughout Mexico. Um, but yeah, there are a number of faith-based initiatives. They look very different. Um, most of them are scrappy um, and, and grassroots. Um, and they've been, doing, they've been doing this work uh, for a long time. Okay, thank you. So we'd like to give an opportunity to, to, to folks to ask us qu your questions, to give us your thoughts, any information you have if you've been on the border. So please, there's a microphone here and there's a microphone on the other side. Everyone's too sad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask a hopeful question at the very end. Okay. okay. Yes. Hi, thank you very much. Um, my name is Beth Furtick. I'm a reporter for WNYC Public Radio in New York. Jo Joel covers national immigration. I cover what happens in New York. And like Joel, I've I started doing this after Trump got elected. I was an education reporter for 10 years. So <laughs> it's been quite an education. I focus on what's happening in New York, which has the largest immigration court in the country, and 
four out of 10 New Yorkers are foreign born. It's, all of this is a big issue. And I would typically see immigration judge master calendar hearings of you know 80 to 100 each morning in New York, tons and tons of families coming from the border, and it's still very busy. But with what you're describing, I'd like to know more about how the pipeline may be narrowing, and if I will be seeing as a reporter big changes in terms of the number of people coming from the border, because there were so many people, and the families were being pushed through on an expedited docket, and judges had to decide on their cases very quickly if they came from the border. Do you see that this pipeline is gonna, who, who is getting through is what I wanna know. How much is it gonna change and how soon? Company miners. Um, maybe I can start. Um, you know, a significant amount of folks are still getting through. Um, when you look at Remain in Mexico, I think it's somewhere around 50,000 folks um, who have um, been subject to this, between 14,000 and 50,000 folks uh, all across the border who've been subject to the program. I think we have the data for, um, what are we in September? So I think we have the data from, no, we're in October. I think we have the August numbers and we're trending down significantly. We're in the 66, you know, 60,000 folks, 50, perhaps we're approaching 50,000 um, for, for um, September in terms of um, arrivals to the US-Mexico border over that month. So the numbers are definitely trending down as a result of remain in Mexico, as a result of the deployment of the military to both sides of the border and throughout the country as a result of um, a number of these different actions that we've talked about. So, so they're having an effect on those numbers and then always at the end of the summer there's always a bit of a trending down. Um, but if you look at just that number remaining in Mexico, 50,000, that's, that's, that's a small slice of the population. So there are still significant folks who are getting through. In El Paso though, it's gone down dramatically. Um, yeah, we, I mean, go ahead, Dylan, sorry. Sorry, uh, so there was a point where we were having 1,000 folks a day or more released mm -hmm. into El Paso some months ago, but now we're about 100, 150 who are released every day um, into El Paso. Um, so folks are getting through. The, I'll just say this and then turn it over to Sue. Um, what's particularly troubling to me about remaining in Mexico and the fact that it forces people to remain in our court system in El Paso <laughs> is that there are tremendous disparities in the court, in the immigration courts throughout the country. And when you look at immigration courts on the border, um, the, the adjudication level, the, the percentage goes way down. In a place like El Paso, there are judges who, who basically are virtually never granted asylum. And we hover between one and 3% mm. approval rate every year. And nationally, it's about 40%. Um, in El Paso, because of aggressive measures by, by many administrations to crack down on the border. That's why we have these inequalities that are present in the immigration court system. And so if you're trapped in the El Paso system, you're at a disadvantage if, if you can't get to somewhere like New York. Mm -hmm. And so that's also troubling about these programs which force people to stay on the border. Sorry. No, no. Um, so in terms of who is getting through, like I was trying to say before, it's pretty random in terms of the Spanish speakers who are subject to MPP. They let some through and some don't. I think uh, what I've heard is that it depends on how many people Mexico will allow them to turn back into whatever border city that day because the Mexican authorities also put limits on how many people can be returned. So, you know, maybe 10 people that day are gonna be detained instead of being sent back. It's, it's, it's very random. Also, all non-Spanish speaking um, mm -hmm. uh, people, um, asylum seekers and Mexicans are still going to be going through and perhaps ending up in, in systems like New York. And there, we are seeing um, a rise in African uh, asylum seekers as well, although many of them are being sort of kept in the southern mm -hmm. part of Mexico by the Mexican army and not even being able to reach the border. But yet, especially in like Tijuana, there's a large African population that's uh, in the metering system there. And with regards to the third country transit ban, I've, people have asked me how is that going to affect the flow. And I want to point out that um, the third country transit ban uh, keeps people from being able to apply for asylum, but they can still get the uh, per perhaps the lesser protection of withholding of removal um, or protection under uh, relief under the Convention Against Torture which are obviously not as good as getting asylum and are a higher burden to meet. But theoretically, judges will still have to hear their cases mm -hmm. to see if they qualify for those 
protection. So it's not like all those cases are just going to disappear. And I, I think just practically speaking, speaking, putting on my practice hat and having been down there, so it's three categories, right? It's the MPP, which are, um, so I have to close my eyes when I do this and figure, the MPP are uh, non-Mexican Spanish speakers by and large, right? Mostly Central Americans. Then you got your metering list, which is non-Mexican, non-Spanish speaking asylum seekers, generally. But Spanish speakers are also on that list. And then you have your Mexicans, so it's three categories, folks. That's how I remember it. Then you have your Mexicans who are on the border trying to seek asylum. So the people that are... But they're they, also metered. It, it, some <laughs> of them are metered, but some of them aren't. There was, so when I was just down on the border two weeks ago, the phenomena that we saw in Juarez was there was... A, the, the, the count when I left was 1,750 Mexicans sleeping on the streets at the bridge points, three bridge points, right? And they were, they were seeking asylum. They were afraid to go back home. Each and every one I spoke with, and I spoke to you know, quite a bit for two full days, were afraid of cartel violence. Um, and they were waiting on the bridges. There was a copy book kept by two migrants on two distinct bridges with the names. There was another copy book on the third bridge kept by a soldier. So it's like the fox in the hen house, right? because we heard a little bit about uh, corruption and the authorities, Mexican authorities, in relationship with the cartels. Well, there you got your whole witness list, right? And if somebody's looking for somebody or somebody wants the names of somebody, there's your list and the Mexican soldier has it. So for those three groups, thinking about trickle and flow, Beth, right? Let's talk about the Mexicans first. Um, with the Mexicans, there is no mechanism in place like there is for the metered group in Juarez that I've seen, that I saw two weeks ago, meaning there's no CBP officer that says, okay, you got 500 here, 400 here, 300 here. What about the list? We'll take 20 in today, right? So people can count on it and say, I'm gonna prepare and I'm going to go in. There is no mechanism. Some bridges of the three that I went to are nicer than others. The free bridge seemed to accept people, but I had to advocate the day I was there to get 16 people in, the youngest being a two month old baby. Um, the Santa Fe bridge, um, uh, the day I was there, I had to advocate and, and the families, 12 people, three separate families, had to wait 95 degree heat in the bridge for three hours. The youngest child there was two years old before they would accept them for their um, interviews. And then I had calls from some of the, the bridge attendants, meaning the migrants, who said since I was there a full week later or 10 days, no one else had been admitted, right? So I don't know if that's retaliation, chaos, they're taking the meter, meter, metering people first, because I have a lot of questions, I'm not gonna assume, right? So you get your MPPs who are processed and thrown back, you got your metering who actually the Mexican government is involved in talking to CBP on the phone and saying, okay, I got this group. And then you have your Mexicans sleeping on the streets, and I'm talking babies, infants, infants, sleeping on the streets and randomly waiting to get called. So that's the situation. So in terms of trickle, Beth, that's a good point. So in theory, your Mexicans who are crossed, right? So I reported and talked to some of the family members after. My, my one gal who was four months pregnant was released. Her two nephews who were unaccompanied minors were released. They're in North Carolina. Her husband and her brother were detained. So there's people being detained. What's not clear to me is, so you have the Mexicans, the Mexicans who are seeking asylum go in accepted, are they gonna be t detained indefinitely? Are they gonna be giving ankle bracelets? Are they gonna be released, et cetera? The same with the metering folks. So I'm not clear on that, and frankly, I haven't been looking at those numbers because we're focusing so much on Juarez and trying to find counsel. But I do think um, you know, it's an issue. So I'm wondering if, no more questions, folks? Wonderful, please come to the mic. I have a young woman here, and then I have this gentleman here. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Um, so I think in the last panel, we touched on this idea of how much border security is enough border security. Um, and I think you also touched at the beginning in the opening remarks about how border communities often don't have a voice in a lot of these decisions being made. Mm -hmm. So if we lived in an ideal universe where people finally were able to come to the table and have this discussion, what would that look like for border security? I mean, border communities in terms of border security? What would you guys ask for? What would that be? What would the ideal version of that be? Uh, that's a good question. Um. 
<laughs> we might have a separate panel on that. <laughs> I have to be more diplomatic in my gestures, apparently. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's a complex question only in this sense because there's, there's like the broad vision, right? But then there's also the reality. So let me start with the reality. Um, if you look at the beginning of the Bush administration, we had um, about 11,000 on paper because Border Patrol has in, uh, incredible problems with retention, Border Patrol agents. We had about 3,000 ICE, uh, ERO, the, the deportation agents, or their equivalent. Uh, and we had um, a CBP numbers, I'm not sure, I want to say around 12, 13,000. Um, since then, today, those border patrol numbers have jumped from 11,000 to 19, 20, 21,000. Again, it's hard because of retention issues and recruitment issues, border patrol agents. But effectively, we've doubled border patrol since then. We've got about 8,000 ICE deportation agents, so we've more than doubled ICE. Um, very little growth in the CBP agents who actually facilitate legal uh, tourism, trade, people who go back and forth in Ciudad Juarez. And Ciudad Juarez, if you don't know our border communities, they're cheek and jowl against each other, Ciudad Juarez and El Paso. If you looked at it from the sky, you wouldn't even be able to tell where one started and the other ended. We travel across every day to study, to eat, to be with family, to work, to go to school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so CBP agents are, are facilitating that legal stuff every day, and they're also obliged to facilitate legal asylum, which they're not doing. They're metering folks. Um, so we've invested a huge amount. The, the footprint of the federal government in border communities is huge. On top of that, um, on top of the so-called boots on the ground, we have, um, you know, we have uh, drones, and we have our communities are literally militarized. We have drones, and and we have uh, walls, and we have checkpoints which ring our communities where you have to stop, you know, and divide literally divide our community into documented and undocumented, mm -hmm. um, and so. We have militarized the government with this massive federal government footprint, which disproportionately impacts us as border communities. And effectively, we've turned those 100 miles of the border into a deconstitutionalized zone. And wait, it could come to you too, because we're 100 miles away from the, we're not 100 miles away from the, the ocean right now. This is, mm. this is legally the border too. So you will see that <laughs> the border is a harbinger of things to come, right? So it's a civil liberties question as well. Um, in terms of resources, um, we were spending in 2004 about $11 billion on border security. Right now we're like around, you all know how hard it is to, to track the federal budget, right? But it's about $22 billion. When we hit that $20 billion figure during the Obama administration, that was significant because that meant that we were spending more on, on, on other federal law enforcement, FBI, Secret Service, DEA, ATF, U.S. Marshals, all that combined. Wow. That's, our, that's where our priorities are as a country in terms of immigration enforcement on ICE and CBP and all that stuff. Um, the fact is that every single time we get, immigra we get immigration reform, and there hasn't been a lot of it, or uh, there's an opportunity for immigration reform, so under the Reagan administration or under the Clinton administration, the opportunity we had under the Bush administration, the opportunity we had under the Obama administration. The fact is, every single time we get reform or an opportunity reform, we always get more border enforcement. And it's never enough. It's never enough. The border is always sold down the, the river. And that happened with the Obama administration's plan as well. And we didn't even get reform, but we got more enforcement. Um, so if we're going to have, in living in the real world, if we're going to have that massive federal government footprint, if the federal government's going to be on our neck like that at the border, then at least we need to inject transparency, accountability, and oversight into that system. At a minimum, in a utopian world, and this could be another panel, we would demilitarize. And we would think about the border differently. Just one example. We think about the border as this place that has to be sealed, right? That's what's wrong with the wall. People wonder why we have such a visceral reaction against the wall at the border. People think well, it's just a tool of national security. Well, for us at the wall, what it does is deepens the othering of the folks on the other side of the wall. We think the other side of the wall is dirty and dangerous mm. and that the people over there are threats. And it makes us think that we're innocent. 
and we can just wash our hands of everything that happens, that we're not involved in the trafficking of drugs and people. We're not involved in the inequality that generates migration. James Baldwin said Americans are addicted to innocence. That wall solidifies that. So we need to get towards demilitarization. Okay. I have, thank you, Dylan. <laughs> and we do need another panel, maybe sooner rather than later. I'm gonna take this gentleman's question and let's be mindful and we have one more gentleman. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Dan Wilson from Building One Community in Stanford, Connecticut. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been, the word has been mentioned a few times in your comments, uh, the word cruelty, which is the one word description of uh, Trump's policy towards uh, asylum and other humanitarian relief. I have a question that uh, Dylan sort of touched on, began to touch on. This is taking place in the context of, of the large scale, legitimate, legal, commercial, and human movement across the border every day. Uh, cities like El Paso are among the most dynamic in the country. Juarez is also a very dynamic place despite the, the crime issues in the city. Um, to what extent is this crackdown, the sealing of the border, having an effect on um, all of the other uh, activities that take place every day going across the border, goods and people? Are you seeing it in the El Paso business community? Are you seeing it in the Juarez business community? Because engaging those actors and those stakeholders in this is going to be part of the solution. Okay, yeah. give a one minute answer. Yeah, um, I have to give a one minute answer. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, certainly there's been an effect and I can give it to you in economic terms. We've had flatline population growth over the last three years. I, I mean, I don't, you know, you can't make a direct correlation, but okay, that's one data point. Um, we've had um, tax, uh, tax revenues uh, in the city of El Paso to the city of El Paso have gone down for the first time in, in a long time. Um, so there's been, a, there's been an, a direct effect on the economy. Um, remember, something like 30 million people cross the border between Juarez and, and El Paso every year, and there are billions of dollars um, in, um, in commerce between the two, between the two uh, communities that pass through Ciudad Juarez and in El Paso, and our economy is, is we, are, we are bound up with their economy. Juarenses, to go back to the El Paso shooting, there were folks from Juarez who were victims of that because they had come to the Walmart. Mm -hmm. Folks, every weekend, if you were to go to that Walmart, the Cielo Vista Mall where the shooting happened, you'd see tons and tons of Juarez license plates. We, our economies are so interlinked. Even the manufacturing that takes place in Juarez, many of this stuff comes over the border several times because it comes over us for value added and then goes back. We're interconnected, our two communities. Um, and so there has been a chilling effect and because of the, the hardening of the border, that costs money, that's real, that's real dollars that have been affected um, by the slowdown in the, in the traffic, in the, in, in the free trade traffic that goes back and forth. Um, so definitely there's an effect. Sorry. Thank you. Unfortunately, I'm wondering if you can come up and talk to us after the panel, sir, and ask the question, because I have one more final question for them. I wanted to end on a hopeful note. Um, so I have one question, uh, and I'd like you all to answer it with one sentence. Um, what is one hopeful thing, uh, or one hope you have, or what makes you hopeful or encouraged um, relating to what you've seen and what you've worked on at the border? And we'll start with Joel. I guess it would be that the appetite for stories about the border and about immigration is, is bigger than what I remember from before this administration and, and even from the early days of it. I mean, I think it's, that's at the audience, that's my editors, that's everybody understands the importance of this story and, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's become more of a priority and, and will that put pressure on stakeholders to, um, you know, to, to get towards comprehensive reform? I, that would be sort of naive to think, maybe, but um, I don't know. I guess it could help. That Thank was more you. than a sentence. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what, you're a reporter. Um, <laughs> I say that with, with great affection. Sue? <laughs> I would say the, the tenacity of those who are there doing the work, mm -hmm. um, they are just fighters. And, mm -hmm. and um, there's just such an appetite for those of us who want to continue to fight and go down there and help, even if we can't be there full time. So okay. that gives me hope. Thank you. I'd say, um, again, many of these things have been going on for a long time. Um, 
there is a difference now um, in, in the level of cruelty. But despite the human damage um, that's happening right now, the fact that the, the Trump administration has gone all out on this means that now what's happening on the border is visible for every single American to see. And more and more you're hearing across the country that this does not represent our values. What we are doing there does not represent American values. The violations of human rights are not something an American support. They don't support a wall. They do support comprehensive immigration reform. And so I don't think it's naive to think that we're gonna get there because hope is what's gonna get us over the, over the, next, the next hurdle. And because it's on display for everyone to see, this is, this is now what's happening at the border. Um, we have an opportunity to, to, to make what's happening at the border to find who we are as a country. And I think that we're gonna choose. We're gonna choose well. And we're gonna have an opportunity to do that. The Trump administration at its peril now has politicized this to a degree and has made this visible to a degree that is unprecedented. And now we have an opportunity to push back in a real way. And so I believe hope's on the way. Nice. Thank you so much to my panelists. Thank you so much, folks, for your participation.